Hi everyone, I'm Jess McClintock. Uh, I'm a senior software engineer at Google and I'm here to talk about CapsLock and how you can use it to make informed decisions about which dependencies you're using. So just for a bit of context, I work on Google's open source security team, also called Ghost. Um, and we support and maintain several different projects, some of which you might have heard of. Um, but the ones I'm here to talk about today are CapsLock and Depths.dev. Uh, so that's CapsLock is our static analysis project, and Depths.dev is a website with information about uh, package dependencies. So to give a brief overview of what I'm going to be talking about today, uh, first I'm going to introduce a permissions type of model as a, a sort of different approach for thinking about dependency management. Um, then I'm going to talk about why dependencies in particular make this a pretty complicated problem space. I'm going to introduce uh, the concept of software capabilities and how this ties into the trust for your dependencies and talk about how CapsLock and Depths.dev can be used to solve these sorts of problems. So the overall idea and problem space I'm talking about today, um, so you've probably seen variants of this sort of uh, diagram before. Um, so throughout the software development lifecycle, there are various stages that introduce different types of risks. Uh, the particular types of risks I'm talking about today are where bad dependencies can get um, used as part of your uh, build. And this is a, a nested problem um, because all your dependencies also have dependencies. So this is a fairly large and um, uh, unscalable problem to try to solve. So where this problem typically um, arises um, is when you're either updating or adding a new dependency and that changes the behavior that you're expecting in some way that you probably don't want. So this isn't actually a new problem space. Um, it's been approached before in the, problem, in the space of mobile phone apps. So um, it, if, depending on how long you've been using mobile phones for, um, early, early days, uh, you would add or update an app and you weren't quite sure what it could be doing. It might use the camera, it might track your location, it could be sharing all sorts of information, very personal information that you wouldn't want and you wouldn't be informed about this and you wouldn't be able to con necessarily consent to that behavior. So when mobile phone app permissions were first introduced, it was pretty much just an informative model. You'd get told, oh, this app can access your microphone whether it wants to. Um, if you don't like that, maybe just don't use the app. That's the only choice you have. And over time, this has evolved into something that's fairly rich. You can make um, fairly granular decisions about when you want an app to have which permissions. Um, is it single use? Is it only when you're using the app? So we can see over time, it started fairly simple, but it's developed into something that you can make informed choices. You can take away consent for particular permissions from an app without having to just take it or leave it, install it or don't. So this is the sort of model we're trying to move towards in terms of how you maintain, update, use dependencies. So um, the model I'm introducing today is really just the sort of informative early stage model, but over time we're hoping that it, it can also evolve into something that's much more granular and where you can make just informed choices about how you use uh, permissions in your dependencies. Uh, so now I'm gonna talk a bit about just why dependency management makes this a bit more complicated than just packaged apps on your phone. So the software that you use in dependencies, um, let's just say you're developing some package A. Well, you can make informed decisions about which packages or which uh, libraries you're choosing to use. Um, but each of those has made decisions about their own de dependencies. And these also have dependencies. So when a problem arises deep in your dependency tree, um, it's not is necessarily isolated to that package. It can affect various other packages and even have an impact on you. And so you can wind up having problems because of some package that you've never even heard of. Uh, because while you've made informed decisions about your direct dependencies, that trust isn't necessarily a transitive relationship. So we can look into this a bit more with some of the analysis we've done on devs.dev. Uh, so this is a graph of the average number of dependencies of a package per ecosystem. And you can see that while the number of direct dependencies is fairly tractable, uh, this blows up significantly when you look at indirect dependencies. Um, so 
this varies a lot across different ecosystems, but in general, the, the number of direct dependencies is, is actually quite small. So when you look at the, main, the, the dependency depth, however, it, it becomes even more uh, concerning. So this is the average number of dependent, the depth of dependencies um, per ecosystem. And again, uh, it's fairly tractable. You're trusting packages that trust packages, and this, this relationship only goes about like uh, four or five layers deep. But when you step into the maximum dependency depth, it gets quite scary. It's not just you trusting people that you, you know, people you know that you know that several, like you know, three or four relations uh, deep. It's getting over 50 layers away from you. And you can be affected by changes made by pack in packages that are 50 steps away from you. You can't reasonably know anything about this package or how it's being maintained or even that it exists. Um, so just to explain why this is particularly uh, different in the uh, NPM space, this is partially due to the philosophy of uh, micropackaging where very small, even one line uh, functions get uh, shipped as a package. Um, so this can make things somewhat more, more maintainable. You don't have to think so much about all of the individual lines of code, but it does make dependency management significantly more complicated in that space. And this can end up impacting the entire development life cycle. So um, it makes it harder for you to maintain packages, it, um, you know, uh, because there are more changes getting introduced upstream. It can be harder to, to test and update. And in particular, it makes it very hard to have secure code when there are so many upstream changes affecting you at all times. So now I'm going to introduce the capability model I mentioned before. So this is based on the software, like the security principle of uh, the principle of least privilege. So the idea that um, access should only be given so that is the minimum required to achieve an end goal. And so the idea here is also that your software should only be capable of the minimal amount of things it needs to do in order to be able to do what you're expecting it to do. So uh, when you make decisions about which packages you trust, um, you need to have an understanding of whether it does the things that you expect it to do or what it claims to do. And this isn't just a single point relationship. This is an ongoing thing. Once you start using a dependency, it doesn't go away. Um, so uh, you need to have an ongoing trust relationship with each of your dependencies. Um, and again, trust isn't transitive, so you need to be able to trust the, the packages that your dependencies also depend on. Um, so you're implicitly trusting a very large number of packages, often um, very nested um, uh, layers of dependencies. And so uh, how can we make it uh, more explicit what each of these packages actually can do? So even if you trust the maintainers of the packages that you're using, uh, their accounts can be compromised or they might just change their mind about how they're choosing to maintain their package. And this all can have an impact on uh, your, own, your own package. Uh, so you're only as secure as the least insecure of your dependencies, as many as they are. So to give a quick um, example, uh, this is the entirety of code in a package called LeftPad uh, that caused a supply chain incident a few years ago. So this is a fairly simple package here. It's just adding padding onto the left side of a string. Um, so uh, the owner of this package decided to pull the package down in protest when the, another of their packages got removed uh, from them in a trademark dispute. And this wound up having fairly widespread impact, even though this is a fairly simple uh, package. Um, and in particular, it only had a few direct dependencies. The majority of packages that were affected were indirect dependencies. Uh, and it, it's a fairly, fairly uh, short and simple package. Uh, so the, the scope of impact of every one of your dependencies is quite uh, overblown compared to what they can actually uh, do in practice. So 
more recently, uh, LeftPad has actually uh, had somewhat of a legacy in that NPM's response to this incident was to make it so that if another package depended on you, you could no longer withdraw your code. And earlier this year, a package was published called Everything, and it depended on everything, which meant that it was actually impossible to take down any package until everything was withdrawn itself. Um, so this has actually introduced a fairly interesting model in that now uh, there's somewhat of a bi-directional relationship in terms of dependencies. It's not just that the code you depend on can impact you. Now, you're, the act of you depending on someone has an impact on what they can do. So there's always trade-offs in, the, uh, in which dependencies you choose to use. And we need to be able to make informed decisions about whether the value they bring or what they are capable of doing is actually worth the potential risks of new dependencies. Um, so when you end up depending on something like LeftPad, it's an ongoing impact of uh, that dependency versus the, the value brought by having left padding on a string. Um, so just as a, another um, example, uh, there's also a package called uh, is odd, which checks if a number is odd. It, it uh, depends on is number, um, incidentally. Um, and there's another package called is even that depends on is odd, and it checks if something is not odd. Um, so is even actually has over 50 direct dependencies and uh, around 500 indirect dependencies, uh, which is a little bit scary given just how obviously um, uh, this isn't really intended as a particularly serious package. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, uh, the things you can wind up depending on is a little bit uh, interesting. Uh, so as a somewhat more serious example, um, Open source is actually also targeted for things like uh, stealing Bitcoin or, uh, yeah. So um, the exa this example is a package called EventStream. And uh, the maintainer was reached out to by someone just saying, hey, uh, can, I, can I have your package? And because they didn't get anything out of maintaining something, they didn't really care about it anymore, they just uh, they handed it over. Um, so the interesting thing about this particular um, example is that event stream itself wasn't the target and it wasn't um, either it wasn't even the payload so the new maintainer changed it so that event stream depended on this other package flat map stream and that had a payload in it that only executed when it was imported by another package copay dash um, which was uh, a Bitcoin wallet so from this particular example it's, it's interesting that um, Dependencies are seen as a, a, a vector for uh, introducing problems. And so even if uh, it, like attackers won't necessarily target your package directly, they will look into your dependencies and they will find maintainers who aren't interested in maintaining them anymore. You can't really be sure of what's going to happen upstream at any point in time. And just as a slightly more recent example, it's already been mentioned several times today, um, yeah, earlier this year, um, there was a, a state-sponsored actor that targeted the compression library XC. Um, and I'd really just like to call out this last line in the message from the maintainer of the package as they're essentially getting um, uh, pressured into adding a new uh, person as a maintainer. Um, keep in mind, this is an unpaid hobby project. So it's unreasonable to throw additional work on people with their unpaid hobby projects. Um, and yet we depend on so many of, of these types of projects. And it's really up to us to make informed decisions about um, how we use them and to make sure that we remain secure. So how can we identify uh, what sort of capabilities are present um, in our transitive dependencies? So, Every package has an implicit set of expected capabilities, of expected things it should be able to do. And our goal is to try and make that more explicit, to make it clear um, what the code is actually doing in practice, and to make sure that developers can make informed decisions about whether that violates their expectations of what they want packages to do on an ongoing basis. 
So we're trying to increase the visibility and transparency around what capabilities are present in code. And again, this ties back to the mobile phone analogy I used earlier. So when I'm talking about capabilities, I'm talking about particular types of privileged actions, uh, things like network access, file system access, um, unsafe uh, code behavior, or the ability to execute um, arbitrary external code. So often these are necessary. These aren't things like vulnerabilities. These are of usually intended behavior. If your networking library uses the network, that's not surprising. That's something you want. Um, so how do we make informed decisions about whether or not we want um, capabilities, what capabilities are, and, and how they change over time? So 98% of the time when a package is affected by a vulnerability, it's affected indirectly. So when we're looking at what capabilities are present in code, we can assume somewhat based on this that many of the capabilities that are present aren't direct. They're actually via indirect dependencies. And as I mentioned before, these are often intended behavior, expected behavior. You're using networking libraries, so now you have network access in some way. So dependency graphs are really just complex directional graphs, and we have a lot of tools to analyze, uh, analyze directed graphs. So um, we use call graph analysis to identify when a, a capability is accessible from a given package. And um, in particular, we look at the function level calls, not the uh, package uh, level ones as in this diagram, um, because if you just look at uh, which packages are imported, that's far too broad. Uh, that'll give you a whole lot of unnecessary um, false positives because you don't use every function in all of your dependencies. Uh, so we look at the function level uh, call graph to identify what code is accessible from your package based on uh, information we get from the particular build of the package. Um, so yeah, as I just mentioned before, um, we get more granular results. We get uh, less false positives by looking specifically at the function calls. Um, but um, all of these function calls can go through various layers of uh, dependencies. So what sort of things can we find when we do this sort of analysis? If we're trying to find um, what uh, indirect capabilities you wind up with through each of your dependencies, um, what sort of risks can I actually introduce? So uh, we've probably already heard a lot about log4j today, um, but just to give a bit of a recap, um, the log4shell vulnerability was a remote co um, code execution vulnerability found in the log4j logging library. Um, this wasn't unintended behavior, but it wasn't malicious either. This was essentially a feature that was added into the library that had unintended scope that could be used um, maliciously. Um, so this is a particularly interesting example in that it shows that your dependencies can add behavior that isn't intended maliciously. It does exactly what it's intended to do, but it isn't something that you want it to be able to do. It's a capability that is unwanted um, and that changes the behavior of a thing that you are using. Um, you want to use this library because it's, it's logging. For, for logging, you're not expecting it to have um, remote code execution or anything like that. So of all of the packages that were affected by log4j, only 20% of them were affected directly which means that 80% of these packages were affected um, by a, a transitive uh, dependency. And um, this just uh, shows just looking just at your dependencies at just one layer deep, it doesn't, isn't really enough to understand what real risks are being introduced to you. And even trusted dependencies, even packages that are well-maintained and well-supported can still make changes that uh, add functionality that you might not want to consent to. So when you find a vulnerability in your dependencies, if that does affect you, that is typically um, something uh, a negative, um, and even like, just in general, it's, it's a negative thing. But capabilities, as I mentioned before, they have clearly different implications from vulnerabilities. So if one of your dependencies uses network access, it's not clearly a negative thing. You have to actually understand what that package is doing on some level. Uh, but there are always upstream changes that can affect you. There will always be a large number of changes 
the relationship you have with all of your dependencies, direct or transitive, is an ongoing trust relationship, and you need to try to, um, yeah, making decisions about that on an ongoing basis isn't scalable because of how many uh, dependencies you can wind up having. So can you plausibly review every one of your dependencies? Um, even if you try to um, audit all of these, it's uh, fairly unreasonable to look at everything you need tooling to make informed decisions about which of these packages is introduces the highest level of risks to you, to direct um, your limited attention to the places that matter. And this is often going to be places that use more privileged permissions that can execute things that you might find more concerning in some way. So the caps lock tool is currently only implemented for Go. Um, we are looking at uh, in, in, uh, implementing this in other languages in the future, um, but I'm just going to give a, a brief introduction of what we have at the moment. So we classify the capabilities um, of a library based on functionality that we've identified in the standard library functions. So we've classified standard library functions in Go to say which of them have particular capabilities, and then we analyze the call graph to identify which of these are accessible by a package um, when it gets built under a particular situation. Um, so uh, just to give a quick example of this, um, let's just say you're analyzing your package, you have um, one direct call, um, so you, you directly call the standard library, um, which gives you the file system capability, and then you call out to some other library. And if that has a, a, a call that um, accesses the network, then you have a transitive call to the, the, the network uh, capability. So you can use capabilities and understand if, um, how capabilities are used in your code and your dependencies at various different uh, points in the development process. Uh, so you can use it while writing your own packages to ensure that you only use the capabilities that, will be, um, that are required to do the things you need to do. Um, and you can also uh, use it to look into your dependencies and make informed choices about, um, about which ones you use and about uh, updates and changes uh, into those dependencies. So uh, I mentioned before that we specifically look at function level calls. So when, you have, um, when you're using a dependency, you're using particular functions with the expectation that they do particular things. Uh, if that changes, that is particularly suspicious because it was already doing just the thing you wanted it to do. Um, so if that changes in some way uh, with the current model, um, you really are only able to remove the dependencies uh, that add capabilities that you don't want. So Capslock is available on GitHub right now for Go. Um, you can uh, install it and run it yourself uh, to identify what uh, capabilities are present in your own Go packages or in any dependencies or other packages that you might be interested in. Um, and we, we also have a structured JSON output that you can use to build any tooling you might want on top of that. Uh, so just as an example of how you would wind up running Caps Lock, um, you can uh, run it over the uh, packages that you find of interest and it'll give you a report of the uh, capabilities and uh, how many calls uh, to each of those capabilities are made. So just to give an example, if we were to work on caps lock on caps lock itself, because it's written in Go, so we can analyze it, um, we would get a list of all of the packages that we analyzed and the particular version that we analyzed them at and all of the capability calls uh, that were present uh, in that particular build. And let's say we looked at this output and thought, well, uh, how can I understand this more? I need to understand why I've run up with these particular capabilities. We've also got a verbose output that gives you example call paths. Uh, so let's say you're wondering why you've wound up with the uh, system call capability. You can look into this and say, well, um, when we are coloring the output um, of caps lock, uh, we call a library that calls another library that checks if it's being run from a terminal and that, uh, that calls the standard library to uh, do a system call, uh, which uh, makes some degree of sense. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about how CapsLock and DevDev are working together to try and make capability more, uh, information more broadly available. So Dev is a website uh, that contains rich information on software packages and the dependencies, uh, dependency graphs, licenses, etc. 
So caps lock results are now available on the depth.dev site for um, the, the Go packages that we've been able to analyze. Uh, and you can find information on which capabilities were present in that particular build. So we, um, we built them in a particular environment if there were particular um, flags that would hide some behavior or uh, if they only uh, build under different environments other than the one we built them for, we wouldn't have uh, all the information. Um, you can also find the number of direct and indirect calls um, of each of these capabilities. And you can use the depths.dev uh, version comparison view to see if capabilities have changed between two versions of a package. So depths.dev also has a freely available API that gives uh, structured information about dependencies and caps lock results will be added to this API soon. So based on the analysis we've done over a, a very large proportion of uh, available Go packages, um, we've found that uh, in general, um, uh, most capabilities are only present in uh, less than say 30% uh, of available packages and the most common ones are things like file access, uh, network access and uh, reflection. Um, but note that this is only of the packages that we're able to build. Um, about a third of packages don't build at all, um, either because we're trying to build them on the wrong environment or um, because they're quite old and uh, just no longer are able to build. Um, so when we look instead at indirect capabilities instead of direct ones, uh, we find uh, that the uh, ordering of uh, like which capabilities are mostly used does change a bit. So in particular, unsafe pointer jumps up quite a lot. And that's because we find that most developers don't use that capability themselves. They rely on fast, efficient, uh, well-established libraries that happen to use that particular capability a lot. Uh, so now I'm going to introduce a new functionality we're adding to caps lock uh, that allows you to do scalable code reviews. So when a change happens to one of your dependencies, um, and that introduces a new capability, you might want to understand how, how has this arisen? What does, it, uh, what does it mean for you? So uh, adding new capabilities is often worthy of uh, some level of scrutiny because it means that the behavior in one of your dependencies has changed from the reason you use that dependency. So the, the logging library that you're using has now added uh, network access to functions you were already using and you didn't want that there. Um, so in general, we find that only about 3% of Go package updates add a new capability, which is a significant, uh, like, uh, it's a significantly more tractable to review 3% of changes or to look at 3% of changes compared to just uh, how many upstream changes occur in practice. So the caps lock git diffing tool uh, it takes uh, two, um, two branches of a, of a, uh, of a Git repo um, and you can compare the state of the capabilities across these two particular commits. Um, and so uh, just to give a bit of an example, so uh, let's say you're working on a library and you have a function called load image and analyze and that calls out to one library for loading the image and another library to analyze and as you might expect, the load image uh, library is uh, using uh, the, the file system in some way. So if there was a change to the analysis library such that now it added that same capability, uh, that's more interesting to you than if you get another call to the cap uh, that same capability from your uh, load image library instead. So uh, we're looking at uh, different granularities of change. So instead of uh, just looking at um, particular, say, function calls, we're looking at um, changes at the, at the like, particular package level. And this is also for transitive ones. So um, if, there was, if this was a much more nested um, change and there was a, a change in uh, one of your um, indirect uh, dependencies, uh, we'd also pick up on that. So just to give an example of how you can use this, um, so you can run the castle git diff on two, um, two branches, one and two, for your package. And uh, you get, um, a, so for this particular example, we're adding a, a direct function a call with a, the files capability. And as expected, we identify that there is a, a new call and a new capability um, with the file system capability. 
And we also give an, an example of call path and how that's happened. Um, so if we add that same function call to a library that already had that um, already had that capability and run the same analysis, we won't add, uh, say that there are any new uses of capabilities. So the idea is that the initial commit provides a ground truth of capabilities that will be noisy to report on. We're only at reporting on the diffs. But we also have the option of running this with the function level granularity. So if there's a change, like let's say you're using two particular functions um, in, your, in, in the image loading library and one of them already had uh, the file system access, if another function you're calling from that same library adds that, um, the, the function level granularity analysis will pick up on that change. So there's a lot of customization you can do to the types of analysis we do with CapsLock. Uh, so you can actually create your own project specific mappings of capabilities. Uh, let's just say you know that you always trust the, the proto or JSON library. You can allow this them to say, I never want to be told about upstream changes to those, li uh, those packages. That's just noise to me, I trust them. Uh, you can also create your own capabilities. Um, so you, uh, in, in the capability mapping we use, you can say, I never want to depend on this particular package. Maybe it has licenses you don't want to ever depend on it or something like that. Uh, so you can then use our call graph analysis to identify if you ever wind up with some sort of uh, transitive dependency on that library. Um, and yeah, uh, you can also do uh, allow listing, uh, custom categorizations, uh, yeah. So for future steps that we're looking for uh, towards uh, in CapsLock, uh, we're hoping to add the ability to have a attestation of what capabilities uh, should be present in your library so that if that is ever violated or changed in some way, um, that you've got a record of what capabilities are present when you added new ones. Uh, it adds a bit of an additional scrutiny and potentially we could even uh, say your package shouldn't build if you've got a capability that you don't want to have. And we're also looking into uh, statically rewriting call paths uh, that introduce unwanted capabilities so that they can never be executed. And uh, we're uh, looking forward to being able to introduce this to additional languages. Um, so CapsLock for Java, CapsLock for Rust, if these are things you care about, please uh, reach out to us. We'd love to hear more um, uh, about what you care about and uh, what excites you the most. Uh, so yeah, thank you for your time. Uh, you can um, yeah, add discussion, uh, pull requests, whatever, to the CapsLock repo uh, we're on GitHub and uh, you can find our analysis results on the devs.dev website. We also have a blog post there. Thank you for your time. <laughs> uh, it looks like we've got a question over here. Um, I love this, this is awesome. Oh, and thank I you. I would love to see uh, using some document describing how to use this in preparing effect statements for vulnerabilities. So if you have an organization right. Oh, that's a really good point. Yeah, we haven't really looked into using CapsLock alongside of back statements before, um, but that's a really uh, interesting capability you were suggesting, and I'd love to follow up on that with you. Oh, what's next? Um, yeah, so you have all these function calls for the capabilities. Yeah. Um, where did you get those original calls from? Was that from a manual annotation, or? Uh, we did just do manual annotation of the, the Go standard library, yes. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. It, it, is there a process for that annotation? Like, is that a repeatable process? And how can we, crowd, how can we scale that? Um, yeah, that's a good point. So is this a repeatable process? Um, I, I, it isn't something that we're, like, we have analysis to identify if new functions are added to the standard library. 
Um, but yeah, it, it is just a manual process uh, to scale it. Uh, with the current uh, process, we would need to have additional people, in, uh, but we can probably have better tooling to identify when new changes occur upstream in the sound library. Um, oh, sorry, Tom. That's a really good question, yes. So the question was, are there any ways to dodge having capabilities uh, being discovered? Um, so we actually have a, a capability that is just called an analyzed, that essentially means this is one of the edge cases that we aren't able to analyze. We can't guarantee that this code doesn't have a capability. Um, maybe it's an interface of some sort where capabilities could be uh, injected in some way. Uh, so we actually try to state where the analysis boundaries are and just classify that in its own way. Um, can you say a bit more about how the capability restriction and the call graph rewriting works and how people can, can target it? It sounds like it can be used to say, like, I don't want this task to be able to, to like, return the file system. But it sounds like perhaps it can also be used to say, like, I don't want this, uh, this, this library loaded or used at all. Uh, yeah, that's a fair question. Um, so with regards to the capability rewriting, this isn't something that we are implementing. It's something that we have implemented yet. Uh, this is something that we have um, as a, essentially a proposal so far. Uh, so the goal there um, at the moment is just to rewrite unwanted ca uh, the call paths, uh, just to say um, if, if this call path is ever reached, it should be a fatal error. I never want to be able to execute this. Um, so it, it's pretty much just like the sort of early mobile phone model where it's like if you took away that capability, that's now unexpected behavior, it might not behave, uh, it might just crash the app. Uh, because this is early days. Uh, we are hoping to move towards the more granular permission model in the future, but I think it will take a few iterations before we are there. Um, I think I'll do one more question and it looks like there's an eager one over there. Yep. Oh, are there any additional capabilities that we aren't classifying that we might consider of interest? Um, yeah, I think there are some that we have discussed. I'm going to have to think for a bit about additional ones we thought about that didn't wind up classifying. Um, I'm actually blanking at the moment on that. Uh, I can follow up on that with you later. If there are any that you think are missing that look um, of interest, please uh, file a bug against us and we'll look into it. Um, thanks. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, enough questions for now. I'm sorry to hold you up so much at the end of the day. Um, thank you for your time. <laughs>